Good morning, everyone. Uh, we hope that you're well uh, uh, on the start of your weekend. Welcome back to Hashtag Sea Arthritis Broadcast Booth. Um, we are broadcasting live on Facebook, Twitter, um, at the Canadian Rheumatology Association and Arthritis Health Professions Association annual scientific meeting. And we are so lucky to have this big hitter of rheumatology sitting with us this morning and kicking off our day. We really uh, thank you. I'm sitting here with Dr. Betty Diamond, um, who's a rheumatologist, uh, hails from Harvard, um, and uh, is the director of the Institute of Molecular, Molecular Medicine at the Feinstein Institute for Medical Research. Um, research which is focused on induction and pathogenicity, you're going to tell us what that means, of anti-DNF antibodies in systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE as many of, uh, of our viewers would know it. So. Uh, Dr. Diamond, please um, uh, please accept our heartfelt thanks for coming. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, we know that you're going on. You are the esteemed Dunlop Dotteridge lecturer for the CRA this year. And I'm very honored. I know, and and we get the privilege of getting some of the pearls from her talk before she actually gives the talk. So um, we welcome you uh, to our studio and thank you very much for your time. And also, on behalf of our patients and members, we thank you for your lifelong dedication to rheumatology and the advancement of science and clinical practice in lupus. So um, welcome, and I guess our first question is a very obvious one. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what lured you into rheumatology? So when I was in medical school, mm -hmm. I was fascinated by immunology and autoimmunity, and I really thought that this was pogo come true, that we met the enemy and it is us. Yeah. And um, I guess um, my politics is what drove me to lupus as well, uh, because it's a disease of women. Yeah. And I'm a feminist. And uh, it's um, a disease uh, where often women's trials are really underappreciated or um, uh, made light of. Yeah. And in fact, uh, the recent work that we've been doing uh, in my lab focuses on neuropsychiatric lupus mm. and focuses on cognitive problems and mood disturbances. And to me, um, what really matters is that we have said this has an organic basis related to the disease. Right. And so many women have been told to relax or given, you know, uh, anti-anxiety medicine or told to see a psychiatrist if it's extreme, or said, don't worry about it, it's because you're distressed by your disease, and to sort of say that it's part of your disease, I think has been such a validation for women. Oh my gosh, it absolutely has been. Um, and I think the in lupus, what we've seen and heard from our members is, you know, the, the, the use of prednisone and long-term prednisone in the disease and the body shaming that goes on when women gain weight or gain, you know, get, acquire that moon face. It is such a cruel, it sets up a cruel environment uh, around them and it's so wrong. So we, we're so happy to hear these messages coming from you that it is the disease. Absolutely. And I think, you know, once you accept that it's the disease yeah. and you start to unravel the process involved, then you can start thinking about specific therapies. Yeah. And that's really important. Yes. <laughs> and, um, you know, an anti-anxiety pill can take the edge off anxiety or a little more sleep may make you have a little less impairment, uh, cognitive impairment, but it's not really going to do the trick when there's an active molecular process going on. Right, so when you think, I mean, this is a tremendous breakthrough, obviously, that, that women can uh, be told through science to, you know what, forget that nonsense, love yourself, which I think is the beginning of the healing process. Well, you know, it was amazing to me. The first time I was asked to talk about this work to a group of 
uh, individuals with lupus, mm -hmm. I was really scared. And I thought to myself, they have kidney disease, they have skin disease, they have other manifestations, and now I'm going to get up and say there's brain disease too. Oh. And I just thought, this is going to be really hard. And what was amazing to me is the number of people who came up afterwards and said, oh, thank you, my doctor never believed me, or my husband doesn't take me seriously. And I should say lupus is not only a disease of no. women, yeah. and the same is true for, for men. For men. Yeah. But it was just this sense that they weren't trying to persuade people of something and nobody was taking them seriously yeah. that was so empowering I think and we know that being empowered and knowing about your disease and feeling that you can uh, sort of um, uh, recognize your own symptoms and be in some control of what's going on yeah. is terribly important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, we run workshops uh, in the country, and I recall one um, gathering in particular, and we do this in partnership with community rheumatologists. So we have a rheumatologist and a patient peer leader, and I remember um, a gentleman stood up when it, it, we have an hour-long question and answer. Basically, we turn the program over to the people that have gathered in the room. And I remember this one gentleman stood up and said, I just want to thank you so much for teaching me that what my wife was going through was real. I kind of didn't believe her. Because of so many, I, want to call, I don't want to call them qualities, features of our autoimmune uh, diseases, are invisible. That's right. And and so that validation for the partner in the life um, was really instrumental in him kind of saying, okay, I believe you. Now, that might not be the best thing in the world at having pre-existed <laughs> in a relationship, but it changed. And I got a letter from them about a year later saying they've never been happier in their marriage, <laughs> their, his wife was doing that. <laughs> that is a little bit of arthritis <laughs> education, a little bit of marriage counseling, it all works. Um, Betty, I want to talk to you about some of the key issues that are facing, I mean, notwithstanding those we've already uh, touched on, but what are patients today, you know, in 2020, what are lupus patients facing today that they may have faced for the last two decades, but or that they may be facing now in 2020 that they, they didn't previously face? Well, you know, in 2018, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration did a workshop with lupus patients and asked lupus patients, what is it that bothers you most? Yeah. And patients said fatigue and cognitive impairment. And those are generally things we don't have we don't treat at all. Yeah. And do you um, have treatments for those things? You know, I think there will be treatments okay. for the cognitive impairment. Okay. And actually, um, I think that there will be treatments for the fatigue coming along yeah. too. But you have to focus on it. Yeah. And it has to be the important endpoint in a study. And we really don't. Um, often design studies specifically. Where fatigue is the primary endpoint. Right, yeah. or where cognitive function is the yes. primary endpoint. Yeah. And so I think that we need to listen to our patients and we need to try to address the issues that most hold them back from having the quality of life that they want to have. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we had a young um, uh, doctoral student uh, in our interview chair uh, a couple of days ago, and, and she presented a poster on brain fog and rheumatoid arthritis. And someone that was one of our, our interviewers, uh, our peer interviewers, was sitting behind cameras and went, are you kidding me? That's a disease feature? <laughs> and it's interesting how you learn these things it, through our partnerships with researchers, um, through our guests, and it's it, we were all sitting here like in rapt attention listening to this, you know, 20 something year old teach us about some of these things that our rheumatologists have actually never talked to us about. 
Um, or to their patients. Or to their patients, <laughs> correct. Um, that's kind of what I meant when I meant to talk to us about it. Um, do you have, our, our uh, viewers, Betty, are always interested in lifestyle tips. Now, I know uh, that might be uh, medicine light for some, but for us, we want to do as many things as we can within our own control. Because as you know, what lupus patients, RA patients, spondylitis patients, we all lose or feel we lose a great deal of control when we're diagnosed and going through the worst of our disease course. So anything you can think of that would help people in their own homes, at their own leisure, at their own interest, anything? Well, you know, I think that what the lifestyle um, uh, recommendations yeah. uh, are really the same for lupus patients as for any other individual. Yeah. You know, you have to get plenty of sleep, you have to eat well, you should exercise, but not to pain. Okay. And, uh, and I think the uh, other important key for lupus patients is to really feel connected to your uh, your own symptoms yeah. and the way your own disease manifests itself because yeah. it's different for every patient yeah. so that you know that you have to slow down when that happens maybe you need to go see your physician so you start uh, instituting therapy early or see what actually exactly is going on yeah. uh, and I think that um, a sort of taking control of your disease that way is really, really important. And it also allows you, as you were saying before, to communicate with people around you right. and make sure they understand because so much of the disease can be invisible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, it, I mean, it's interesting when my rheumatologist talks to me about some of those things that you've raised that are very important, um, you kind of go, oh, really? It's, that sounds too simple. But in combination with a really good treatment plan and good management um, delivered to you by your rheumatology care team, they are really important I pieces. I think that's right. Yeah. I think it's not instead of no, for sure. um, medication. Yeah. That would be a big mistake. Yeah. Um, I yeah. tried that myself, didn't work out so good. <laughs> but you know, there's another thing that I think patients sometimes um, don't realize and that um, which is that if you feel that you're having problems with right. the medication you need to let your doctor know right away yeah. that there are a lot of medicines that have side effects uh, and the sooner people change doses, change medicines, whatever, the better. So it's not rather than just abandoning it and not saying anything. Abandoning it or plunging forward despite uh, the problem. Right. And I think that, um, you know, a disease is really a partnership or dealing with the disease between a patient and a physician. Yeah. And you really need to do your part in the partnership, which is to inform the physician of exactly what you understand about your disease and you understand about the medicines you're applying. I think that's an incredible key message um, because you, are, you have your own set of expertise and skills and tools. But unless I come in and kind of plug the cord in to the wall and give you electricity to use them, it, it, it might not be that beneficial to me, no matter how talented, how skilled, how experienced. I need to feed you with information, That's with data. Right. And then you That's go, hmm, right. okay, Cheryl, what do we do with that information? And here's what I know best to incorporate into your treatment plan. So I, I just love that whole message about the partnership. It's something that we underscore arthritis consumer experts all the time we say it's why experts is part of our organizational name I would just also say that advancing our knowledge of disease is a partnership between researchers and patients, and patients and the more patients become involved in research the more we can move forward not only for yourself 
But for those who follow in your absolutely. footsteps, yeah, absolutely. it's a very altruistic thing practice. to do. Yeah, it is. Yeah, Betty, we want to get from you two pearls you're going to deliver in your talk very shortly. We're cognizant of the time, and you've got to go and prepare. And we don't want the organizers of the meeting to freak out because you're not there when the podium <laughs> lights go on. Um, but give us two two pearls. Um, well, I think talk. I've really already, yeah, have already said talked them. about them. Yeah. One is that the invisible cognitive and mood problems that you experience may be part of the disease process. Uh, and the other is uh, sort of know thyself and physicians listen to your patients. Well, you heard it here from the esteemed Dr. Betty Diamond. Um, we're just going to go to the audience and see if there's a quick question or two. Can you comment on the relation between hormones and lupus? So that's to me. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I think I won't answer that question. <laughs> well, you know, I think that um, lots of... Uh, Patients with lupus and with other rheumatic diseases know that their disease uh, symptoms can fluctuate with menstruation, with menstrual cycle, and there clearly is a relationship. My own feeling is that it's not so in everybody, that there's a group of patients who have a hormonally responsive disease and others who don't, and again, understanding that about yourself and for the physician to understand that about you, I think uh, improves uh, the way uh, the patient and the physician together manage disease. Yeah. Another question. Might be a little political. But <laughs> I never shy away from She's, She already <laughs> said she's a feminist. Lay it on us. Regarding what you said about women's lupus symptoms historically being questioned or invalidated, do you think lupus research and treatment would be further ahead today if it wasn't most likely to impact women between 15 to 45? You know, that's a good question. I, I would turn it around and I would say that I think advances in lupus therapy have gone hand in hand with more women physicians. And we know that the more diverse uh, a group is, the more facets of whatever problem they're looking at uh, get looked at. So I think having women physicians has been very important for women's health and hopefully because all women physicians begin as young women physicians. Uh, it means that like we're you, we're you. Attend, once upon a time, <laughs> we're attending to younger women's problems too. So I think, you know, it's a plug. You asked, said it might be political. This is a plug for politics. Inclusion and diversity matters. Well, there's a reason we love this woman and this physician and this scientist. Um, because she's not only incredibly, incredibly talented, gifted scientifically and medically, she's a good human and a great feminist. So we really <laughs> love, loved having you, Betty. Thank you for coming in so Thank much. You. We're forever in your debt, and congratulations again on your lectureship. Uh, we're going to actually, as soon as you go, we'll all be like following you in the lecture hall. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.